from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hello again. Welcome to the show. So, how do we interpret that dramatic defeat for President Obama and the advocates of even just a little teensy-weensy amount of gun control in the Senate yesterday? And specifically when I say we, I mean we as Chicagoans. Would it have had that much effect here if it had passed? Would it have truly affected the rampant flow of guns and ammo that come across that unregulated Indiana border? Superintendent McCarthy does like to point out that we're already pretty much awash in guns and that the CPD takes nine guns off the street for every one they grab in New York. So yeah, maybe even a baby step might have been helpful here, but McCarthy says the way to get a handle on our violence problem is to lock up all the people who have guns illegally. So we'll try to figure out if any of that means anything to us. Of course, we still want to keep our focus on those school closings, and we want to take a look at this agreement with the Cubs and all that money Rahm Emanuel's collecting for his reelection. What about that? And by the way, welcome Rick Perry. We understand you're in town. Maybe you're watching the show today. Uh, here to poach some businesses away from Chicago. So welcome to you, as, uh, particularly here on Chicago Newsroom. Alex Keefe joining us from the powerhouse WBEZ radio. Glad to have you. Thank and you. from the powerhouse Chicago Tribune, the the city's most expensive newspaper, John, <laughs> <laughs> John Byrne joining us Thank today. You for so me. it must be good because it costs so damn much money. Yep. So, um, well, first of all, thanks for coming through the floods. For we those of you it, yeah. watching the program on Thursday, Friday, Sunday, Monday, this will seem completely irrelevant, but uh, we, we made it through, uh, I don't know, 18 inches of water to get here today. So. There were animals in pairs on Lake Shore. <laughs> Giraffes and elephants, two by two. Yeah. Are they, are they uh, separated by party, by political yeah, party? Yeah, that's, yeah. Right. that's how they did it, yeah. Okay. All right, so... Um, Let's begin, if we can, with this uh, with this gun thing and the Senate. Um, we ask the question: Does it really matter in Chicago? Because, as we say, the the you know perhaps what we should be doing is what Bernie Stone once did to the city of Evanston. We just need to build like a concrete wall along the border <laughs> and keep the guns out from Indiana. I mean, it's I was surprised. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't do national politics all that much, but I was surprised by the fact that it seems like not much is going to happen with this. I mean, mm -hmm. after all this talk, after all this lobbying, all of this stuff, vote after vote, came down in flames yesterday. I think it's particularly kind of embarrassing for both of Illinois senators, Republican and a Democrat, Dick Durbin and Mark Kirk, who have both been pushing for this legislation. Especially Mark Kirk, Especially who really Mark, put stuff on the yeah, line. Mark for Kirk, this. who's yeah. been one of the people involved in these negotiations. Yeah, yeah. And here at the end, well, at this stage at least, mm -hmm. we have nothing. So uh, politically, I think that's kind of a tough thing. As far as stuff coming over from Indiana, I'm not exactly sure how the legislation would have affected things and shake them down. I mean, as, as the NRA is like to say, if people want to get a hold of illegal guns, they're still going to get a hold of them. But right, it seems right. like those, those gun shows in Indiana, show. the, the shows, Chicago right. police have said mm -hmm. a lot. This mm -hmm. is a big source of the guns yeah. we're finding on the yeah. streets here. So, Well, both your organizations have done some very fine reporting on Indiana and those gun shows, mm -hmm. and, and it's just, it's really disturbing to see how how much of that traffic comes across the line. I mean, yeah. it's one thing to go down there and buy your illegal fireworks, but to go and buy your illegal guns. Crazy Kaplan yeah. has the, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, Crazy Kaplan the gun, uh, right. the gun right. show right. set up as well. I mean, I you know, if you listen to what Emanuel said yesterday, Mayor Emanuel, you know, this is something he's been hammering on and hammering on, the need to close these gun show loopholes, and I guess this would have done some of that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know how much it actually would have done to... Uh, to, to stem the flow here, mm -hmm. but uh, he saw it as an important step. Obviously, right. the president did as well. It was it was noteworthy how similar their statements were, the president and the mayor, on, on this topic. Well, they both have the same speech writers. They do. So. And yeah. you know, Indiana is notable for its proximity, but there's a lot of states in the country where to get a gun, you need to be a citizen, you need a driver's license, mm -hmm. you have to be 18 or 21, and right. that's it. Illinois right. is pretty unique in the fact that we have a, a rigorous uh, system where you need a special ID card and all of this stuff. There aren't a lot of states that have that. So if it's not Indiana, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, it's like, well, if it's okay. So if it's not Indiana, where else could it come from somewhere else? Mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. it remains to be seen how much the federal background You did You did some that. excellent reporting on Illinois' FOID cards, mm -hmm. the uh, firearm owner identification cards. 
and what they really mean and how they really work. And I think it's really important to talk about that because if I'm not mistaken, one of the things that would have that, that the Republicans wanted to do was to um, they had an amendment that they threw in the hopper yesterday that if you have a gun that you've purchased legally anywhere else in the country, mm -hmm. it should be legal everywhere in the country, which would mm -hmm. mean that Illinois' void card thing, as full of holes as it is, would have been even more weakened. Yeah, the system is, the, the system, at least, w the, the part I looked was a little bit kind of wacky. I mean, the, the, the part that my reporting focused on is what happens when a FOID card is revoked. So a FOID card is like a driver's license for gun owners, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to buy a gun or have a gun or shoot a gun at a range, you need this card. And in theory, you get it revoked or taken away, and you shouldn't have guns or ammo if you are mentally ill, if you're a criminal, if you, you know, have a restraining order against you. In practice, all the state does is they send you a letter that says, please, Mr. Criminal, please send us your card back because you've been convicted of this. I hate to laugh now, at this, but when I when I heard you describing this on the air, I, that was my reaction was, oh, that'll happen. And this has, been a, yeah. this has been the reaction of a lot of people I talk to. Now, in especially dangerous situations, the state police does say that they go after these. Cook County Sheriff Tom Dart has made a big point of going after these. The mm -hmm. Chicago police for many years have gotten this list of revokees from ISP to go after them. But as of a year ago, the ISP, the state police, said 70% of the cards are still floating around. When I asked just a little bit ago, they wouldn't give me hard numbers, but they said a majority. So what this means is, even if you can't buy new guns at Cabela's, if I can't go to get a 30-06 for deer hunting season, mm -hmm. you can still buy guns in private sales where there's no background check, and you can still buy ammunition. The bigger issue I think that gun advocates have talked to me about is no one goes to get the guns when they're revoked. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. technically you're illegally in possession of a right, gun, right, but it's right. not like somebody's knocking on Well, that would be confiscation. Right. That would be a violation of the Second Amendment. But you know, it's something that even the NRA, when I talked to them, I was surprised. Say, well, you know, we, we agree that these guns and these voids should be taken away, but w we disagree on how they should be taken away. So this is a principle that both sides seem to agree on, but the system is not set up to do this. And it, it comes down to money and resources. I mean, the state police have 16 people in their FOID department. What, are they going to knock on 6,058 doors last year and say, is we that, need your cards back? Is that how many That's how many they revoked in 6, fiscal 000? 2008, yeah. So we don't, we, of course, we have no way of knowing how many guns that represents. No, because we don't, we don't track guns. 6,000 guns. You would think so. I mean, you more. could get a FOID card and not have a gun, mm -hmm. but the police Police departments have told me, you know, in practice, you can probably have a gun if you have a yeah, FOID card. That's yeah. why you got the FOID card. In the per right, for, right. for their purposes, when they knock on a door with somebody who has a FOID card, they presume that they have a gun. And, and Illinois is one of only, what, four states? I think it's four states, states that, that have this. That Not have a lot of, this. As I was yeah. saying with Indiana, a lot of states you can go with a driver's license if right. you prove you're a citizen. Yeah. Uh, you can buy a gun. Yeah. Illinois is extraordinary in that you have to go through this whole FOID system. Which leaves the whole thing kind of up in the air about whether whether it really has any validity because if the system itself doesn't work very well and we're surrounded by states that just will let you buy anything you want pretty much any way you want, then it really but seems But it looks like, like it works. If you <laughs> read the law, it's written to make it seem like we're taking the guns away and the, and the, the cards away from people who aren't supposed to get them. But uh -huh. it, it comes down to a money issue. I right, mean, as long right, as the General right. Assembly keeps giving more responsibilities to departments but not more money, it's going to be a problem. But, I, and we'll get off of this, but, but the... I mean, the, the, the FOID, if, if I have a FOID card, it means I can go and I can buy a gun, but there is no there is no record kept of the gun that I bought with that card. There right? is, for 24 hours, and then oh, the for record, 24 and hours. Then the record, okay. and then the record is destroyed. Well, that's I'm, got teeth to it. Because I've been trying to get yeah. a hold of those records, but those records are kept under lock and key. The records are destroyed after a very short amount of time. My, my point being that if I, if I am suddenly found to be the mentally crazed, deranged person. That, that we all know you that, to be, that, yeah. That I'm well known to be. <laughs> and I get a polite letter from the ISP asking me to return my card. I might or might not return my card, but no one knows what guns I have. And no, no. one's going to come knocking on my door to say, oh, by the way, you purchased these five guns. Where are they? Some places have, just like I said, in Cook County and Chicago, they've taken it upon themselves to come knocking on their doors. And yeah. in some extraordinarily yeah. dangerous situations, it seems like the federal alcohol, yeah. uh, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, they will come knocking too. Yeah, yeah. But in the majority of cases, maybe a lot more than a majority of cases, yeah. no, we, there's, there's no way to track the guns because they don't track individual guns. You know, it, it, it's occurred to me in the past, that, and this is, this is just, this is goofiness, I understand, but um, it just seems to me that the way to solve all of these problems, here's the way to solve the problem. When you obtain a gun, 
then that gun is essentially, in some digital way, tattooed to your wrist. Mm -hmm. that, that you can never get away from the responsibility for that gun until you have legally sold it to someone else. or, or, right. or tra So that that way, if that gun is used in a murder, then you are responsible for mm -hmm. the murder. You're tried for murder. What he's trying to do with this, the, the, these tougher transfer laws that, mm -hmm. he and, that he and Emmanuel talk about a lot, but then when you get down to it and say to him, how often do you find the serial numbers filed off these things? You know, mm -hmm. he, he gives us this idea that, that if we just make it illegal to transfer a gun mm -hmm. without reporting it, then we'll be able to track that gun along. But how yeah, difficult yeah. is it to the just file off the number? Yeah. And right. then where right. does that leave you? you right. It doesn't do you any good anyway. Yeah. Or how often do you have the gun that's registered to you versus you giving it to somebody else? I mean, mm -hmm. there would, practically speaking, it seems like there would be a lot of ways yeah. around this. For what it's worth, I, I attended the, uh, the weekly McCarthy gun show uh, that uh, was out in uh, Austin this week, uh, you know, the Did every they have Monday like morning. Muzzle loading, like Civil War era <laughs> rifles they had confiscated. You hit it, you hit it right on the head. Just these crazy First guns, of all, right? there were three reporters there, if you can count me as a reporter. I'm not sure that that's what I would call let's myself, start, but there it. were three media, accredited yeah. media people there. There were 18 ministers standing behind yeah. him, and there was an array of what I would call, uh, knowing nothing about guns, looked to me like approximately World War I vintage <laughs> <Right>. rifles <laughs> right. of various kinds that, that they claim they picked off the street this week. And alternately, you'll turn up and they'll have these things that look like they just came out of Baghdad, like right. these like <laughs> right. mounted on the back right. of a tank type right. guns. And right. you say to them, like, how many... Uh, why, why are these the guns that they insist on showing us? The guy yeah, tells yeah. us he's pulling the, all these handguns off the street every yeah, year. Yeah, you you yeah. go to these things and yeah. it's invariably <laughs> either ancient or right. like paramilitary. Right. There are like right. no <laughs> crimes right. in Chicago right. being committed right. with these guns. And I, and I, I, if I had had more nerve, I would have asked, why are there no handguns on that table? Because mm -hmm. if you're pulling all these guns off the street, wh where are the ones that are actually doing the right. killing? Yeah, exactly. So, but anyway, that I guess that's really neither here nor there. We've got we've got such a busy news week going on here in our little newsroom. We've got to talk about a bunch of stuff. So uh, we we've uh, decided that we can't do anything about getting guns off the street. So let's move to something else. We I thought we'd so. solve that. Oh, today, I thought we had. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, I, I think the uh, probably the, the what would be the big story in an ordinary week is certainly the settlement with the Cubs, and, and it's a big deal for Rahm Emanuel, something that uh, eluded his predecessor for 20 years. He was able to work something out with the Cubs. John, do you think it, you think it was uh, a know, big the, deal for him? The, the term settlement now, let's not <laughs> get ahead of ourselves here. This is a framework <laughs> of a consensus. It's it sounds the like mayor, Middle East negotiations. The, the, the mayor, you know, we, we spent two weeks hearing we're very close. We're not very close. We're very close. We're not very close. And then they made this announcement. And then the mayor, in his first public statements after this announcement, where he took questions anyway, but, you know, was very careful to characterize this as a framework starting point, and there's still a lot of work to do. Now yeah. he's claiming it is a victory and and is a big deal, mm -hmm. um, but. But uh, there seem to be a lot of uh, discrepancies as to what exactly we're, we're still looking at here. The Cubs came out and said they still want a 6,000 square foot sign in mm -hmm. left field, the mm -hmm. billboard, and a 1,000 square foot sign in right field, the Toyota the see style see-through right, thing. Yeah. And that's not quite what the initial statement out of the city said. The city said 5,000 square feet and 800 mm -hmm. square mm -hmm. feet. So. Mm -hmm. There's still some discrepancies there, and then then the Cubs are going to have to bring forward this hotel plan, and Alderman Tunney and the mayor's office are characterizing this as an opportunity to really get into the fine point negotiations of how this is all actually going to end up looking. They're saying that during the landmark process and the city council committee process, they're going to be able to, I think, you know, they feel like maybe turn the screws on the Ricketts a little more. and still pull some stuff out of them. But but it's interesting to me that, that w w the, the, the big headline that seems to be coming out of this is that unlike all the other stadium deals that we've ever seen, and certainly in Chicago, the taxpayers are not on the hook for this one. They're not going to pay for it. The, this is being done with private money. Right. But then we're gradually learning that, well, they are going to encroach on at least two of the three streets that surround, or four that surround the park. They're going to build a bridge across C Clark Street. They're not going to pay for air rights. They're not going to pay for the additional uh, additional taxes for the for the property that they're seizing right. from the city. Right. And now I see in your newspaper today that um, 
they're looking for some federal tax credits yep. too. Some federal landmark uh, designation, which uh, apparently Fenway got when mm -hmm. Fenway was renovated, which is the plan the mayor constantly cites and the Ricketts's mm -hmm. constantly cite as their kind of blueprint here. And apparently uh, that was good for about $40 million uh, in tax relief uh, on the Fenway deal. So it's so not, it's not, it's not completely devoid of effect uh, of taxpayer effect. Well, we're right. not paying for it, but we're not not paying not not paying for it. For it. Right. Which is which is one of the very clever ways that we have of taxing people now. We we tax people by dinging them for going around a, a corner the wrong way or, right. or going 20 miles over the speed limit or something. But it's not taxes. It's just a, just a different way. But this is even better because this is not not taxing you. Right. <laughs> I, I think, I, admittedly, John has covered this issue a lot more than I, but I'm sort of looking at it thematically to see how the mayor and this administration deals with these negotiations. Yeah, and yeah. for the record, the quote, which I think is the quote of the week oh, from yeah. the mayor when he was asked about this, what he thought of this whole plan. He said, it's a framework of an understanding and a consensus, which is a triply qualified <laughs> statement. Um, but I think it'll see, I'll be interested to see once these public fora begin, there's these community meetings, exactly how much this ends up being a framework or if this mm -hmm. plan actually changes mm -hmm. at all I, I mean, or, to, to, or, yeah, or if, it, if it just stays how it is. I, I think that Benjamin Netanyahu would say that he has that with the Palestinians, right? He's, he has a framework of a possible understanding of, the, the of a mayor, policy. The mayor loves to do this, though, yeah. where we come out with an initial plan comes out, and he's done this you know, on, on his budgets, on mm -hmm. things like the yeah. digital right, right. billboard Billboards, deal. Yeah. Where, where one night one one plan comes out and then over the next several months mm -hmm, he mm -hmm. extracts some yeah. sort of yeah. around the edges yeah. concessions from right. all the parties and then he can come on stand in front of the microphones and tell us about how he yeah. played yeah. tough yeah. and how he went went to the mat for the Chicago taxpayers right, and the people right. of the city now how much of this was built in fat with the understanding right. that it was going to get mm -hmm, trimmed so mm -hmm, that he mm -hmm. could present himself right, as right, the right hard nails negotiator that we know him to be uh, is is difficult to we uh, we love to speculate on this show and one of my favorite speculations is imagining being in the room when these little <laughs> conversations are happening sure. and i just sort of imagined that cell phone call with uh, with tom ricketts when he said you know there is no way in hell i'm giving you tax money on this it's just not going to happen so as long as i'm mayor it's not going to happen now you come back to me and you tell me that you're going to put your money in there and then we've got then we've got an environment where we can talk yeah. and then we'll, we'll we can give you all kinds of stuff but right. you cannot come to me for taxes you come to me and say you're putting 200 300 400 million in there right and then we're then we have a press conference right yeah. and even better <laughs> like you know if you come and tell me you're going to put this money into the ballpark right right i might be amenable to something like a large hotel yeah. for instance <laughs> right, you know right, and right. That, i mean that's just yeah, a cash yeah, machine yeah. that hotel is just and a cash machine you, you know, know the, the people that i have some kind contact with the, who have been neighborhood organizing up there for decades tell me that the the bar owners are just livid over this thing of closing the streets on on oh, sure. uh, game days because sure. it basically just cuts the heart out of that crowd going right. you know, flowing into mm. the bars right. they hate this thing or at least many of them do and yeah. and it just very quietly got in there and you know 10 more games maybe more than 10 more games so all the things that the neighborhood had been organizing over the last 20 years and thought they had some kind of a of an agreement that's all right. out the window that's all and, gone. Or, or the traffic study they keep the neighborhood keeps saying we need right. the traffic right. study right. now right. will you get us the traffic right. study right. please the parking right. study and they still haven't they still haven't seen those and, and things, this this know? by the way is one of the one of the uh, just like Saul Alinsky had a, a playbook for how you do community organizing Rahm Emanuel has one too you go in with the nuclear option mm -hmm. and then you back off we're gonna have to close 300 schools yeah. But okay, I'm going to listen to you now. Okay, we'll only close 50. <laughs> that's how it works, yeah. and that's how that that was the same kind of thing that happened here. I think. Seems like it. So, um, as long as we're speaking about His Honor, uh, His Honor has uh, apparently raised quite a little bundle of money over the last few weeks from his uh, brother out in California and other places. What's going on here? How much how much money has he raised, and does it matter? I think it matters. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I we asked him, he he raised three hundred about let's call it three hundred eighty-six thousand dollars in the first three months of the year. 
This means that in his pocket he has, between two campaign funds that he controls, about two million bucks in politi political money that he could spend to influence elections. Now, so elections if you're Gary Chico and thinking, I'm going to take another <laughs> run at him in 2015, right, you, better you better come up you with two million that pretty much fast. Money. Right, anybody yeah. else, yeah, yeah. Every, he's, he's raised a lot of big money. I asked him about this yesterday, or uh, the other day, and he, he wouldn't say whether he was running for re-election, but he did say, I didn't even ask him about his brother, but he made the answer about his yeah. brother pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. As, as soon as I said, are you going to run for re-election, Mayor? And he said, you know what? It would be news if my brother wasn't helping me out. You know, of course I expect my brother to help me out. He's my brother, you know. I, I didn't ask anything about his brother, but uh, bring so up. So he'd been rehearsing that answer in the back of the with He was ready for me to ask him actually a tougher question than I did. He loved right. the family as a, as a shield, a right. right. sword, like yeah. how dare you, you know. Yeah. Right. If right. he feels you anywhere That's near around right. right. maybe right. impugning his relationship my children, with his uh, Where kids my children go family. to school is right. Yeah. right. Right, yeah. But according, yeah. To, according to the Trib solid reporting, he raised 158000 from California, mm -hmm. where, of course, his brother uh, Ari is a, is a big name entertainment mm -hmm, agent mm -hmm, out there mm -hmm. um, so he doesn't need to say whether he's running for re-election I think that the numbers in this campaign fund yeah, would yeah. highly suggest yeah. that they could speak on his behalf pretty confidently but uh, to get actually a little bit more serious about this we saw this week uh, uh, what what I think is a kind of an odd statement by the CTU that they want to start organizing mm -hmm. politically organizing against him I mean I, I think maybe they're feeling their oats a little too much over the, the victory of the strike and that they think they have more power than they might actually have. But I, I You know, know, I think that they, we, we saw a few years ago during uh, the fight over Walmart that mm -hmm. several unions, you know, organized, raised a lot of money, put a lot of money into aldermanic campaigns and bounced a bunch of aldermen mm -hmm. who Mayor mm -hmm. Daley was backing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I know that it's, a, it's on a different level to say we're going to take down Rahm Emanuel, yeah, but... Yeah. You know, if they can, if they can sort of raise their standard now mm -hmm. and say, you know, rally to us, we're gonna, we're gonna be the, the sort of clearinghouse for this, what they feel is kind of a seething, yeah, yeah. anti-Rom sentiment mm -hmm. that's just looking for somebody mm -hmm. to sort of mm -hmm. give it cause. Yeah, that maybe yeah, they feel yeah. like they can, you know build somebody up. They still need a candidate to yeah, run against yeah, him. Yeah, There's yeah. that. Probably but not Karen Lewis, I would Probably guess. not, but right. you know when but when you see Rahm Emanuel raising three hundred and whatever thousand dollars in mm -hmm. the first few months of the year, mm -hmm. the CTU is I think implicitly saying the person who runs against Rahm Emanuel isn't gonna have to match him dollar mm -hmm. for dollar mm -hmm. because we're gonna we're put gonna money organize. in. We're gonna organize yeah. and we're gonna put money in. Yeah. SEIU uh -huh. which is mm -hmm. in a big fight with the mayor over a number of different contracts, mm -hmm. they're going <clears> to <throat> put money in, mm -hmm. you know, and there are a bunch of other unions that well, are angry. There's, the, there's always all the city unions, too. Right. I mean, the firefighters, the police, Fire, the right. garbage I mean, workers, right. everybody's got exactly. a beef with Ron mm -hmm. at this Exactly. Point. So if you can be, if, if as Karen, Lu, maybe, I mean, I, I haven't spoken to her about it, but maybe she feels like she can sort of give a voice to this mm -hmm. kind of uh, yeah. amorphous yeah. uh, anti rom sentiment. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, in late May when they say they're going to kick up this political campaign. Obviously, the mayor's a target. I've been pushing their political director to identify other targets. I haven't gotten names from them yet, but mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see what, what kind of response they get from mm -hmm. this whole thing to yeah. see if there can be yeah. real fallout. They, well, they I raised, I should say, they raised $52,000 in the first quarter, so I there's think some you, money. You there. both bring up a very interesting question that, that there are obviously vulnerable aldermen who would be very, I would say, reasonably easy pickings because mm -hmm. it doesn't take very much to put a lot of money into a, into a ward and right. beat an alderman. Sure. And these guys are nothing if they're not nervous and so it yeah. could be it, and it they could have make the, them jittery they have the and they have the walmart example is yeah, yeah. just a few years ago right, there are right. a number of aldermen right. who are on the council now yeah. because they unseated yeah, pro yeah. walmart aldermen but of course and you've also seen this this story recently of uh, you know that, that this is the most compliant city council in modern right. history right. It, you know richard j daly gets up in the right. morning and looks down on this and says this is disgusting right. <laughs> no mayor should have that amount of trust <laughs> so right. as long as we're talking about that the one other story that really caught my eye this week uh, and it didn't get as much play as I would have thought it would have, is this notion that the Chicago Public Schools has quiet, I don't know if quietly, but they have announced that they're going to borrow money so that they can close these schools because they have to put so much money into the quote unquote welcoming schools, mm -hmm. even though they're closing schools that already have the air conditioning and the libraries that they're gonna put in the other, it's so crazy. 
but now they're talking about $25 million a year for 30 years, for more, the, for more indebtedness. Service. Yeah, I mean, this, this, this revelation, which came from uh, Catalyst and also our education reporter, Linda Lutton, reported on it, kind of strikes at the heart of one of the arguments, one of the arguments that the school district has been making is that we need to close these to save money. Mm -hmm. Originally, they had ballparked that this was, say, $43 million a year. This is, back then, a very small portion of the annual CPS mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. But now they're saying they're borrowing $329 million. Let's call it a little bit more than $200 million of which will go to fund these school actions. Mm -hmm. um, if you pay down the debt service from the money you're borrowing, that's $25 million a year for 30 years. These are a lot of numbers coming at you. But yeah, yeah. if you subtract the $25 million from the $43 million, if that's an accurate way to do it, suddenly you're saving a lot less money with these school closings that's than sure. you thought. And we hadn't, sure. this is something we hadn't heard about before. So right. it wasn't a lot of money in savings to begin with. Yeah. It was less Almost than one nothing. less yeah. than one percent of yeah. the CPS yeah. budget. Right. Yeah. Um, but if you add in this, if you pay down the money you're borrowing, you know, the money saving argument it yeah. gets a lot harder to make. Right, right. And that was the principal reason we we're always hearing about this billion dollar deficit and that they've got to close it somehow and the way we're gonna do it is close all these schools. And and then of course you have all the other schools that have been sitting around for years waiting for their libraries because mm -hmm. they are at hundred and twenty percent enrollment. Right and they're getting nothing out of this and they're just watching this and and they're they're going kind of crazy like well what about what about the two million dollars that we never got for the roof that's leaking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the mayor is sort of you know he's he's been staying with the savings argument but he's sort of been pivoting away yeah. from that yeah. recently right, right. to the to the equally problematic uh... we We're need higher quality higher education quality right, for, right. for these kids and we've seen through lots of education reporting over the last few weeks that some of these schools are better. Right, right. A good portion we're of them We're putting your kid in a better school may, may, except yeah, for the ones not, that were not. We're not right. better. So, yeah. you know, that's a problem as well. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, we got about a minute left. Uh, it, we can't do the show without observing the fact that there was a horrible event in Boston at the marathon this, uh, this week and that uh, it makes us in Chicago wonder if there are any ways that it might affect us. Do you guys have any just kind of closing thoughts on that? What might it mean to um, our marathon, to the big music festivals coming up, Pitchfork and uh, Lala, yeah, the, Taste the, of Chicago? The music festivals and Taste of Chicago already have point of entry security. I would imagine maybe we'll see more cops outside, but I don't think people who attend those will see a huge difference. The marathon is something else entirely. I think uh, the mayor said the other day mm -hmm. he's waiting for the after action report mm -hmm. out of Boston mm -hmm. and then he'll sit down again with all his public safety people and I imagine we will see substantial changes to the way security is handled yeah. based on yeah. whatever they learn. It's funny because we think we live in this very high security society and yet it's just real easy for Okay, that's it. We ran out of time, as, as we always do. We run out before we finish everything we want to talk about. But Al Keith, thank you so much for thank being you, on the Ken. show today. John Byrne, Chicago Thanks Tribune. Thanks for having Al me. Al from WBEZ. It's a pleasure to have you. Hope you guys will come back again sometime real soon. You, you have been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV, which you can see right here on Can TV. But if you go to this address right here, this one right on the screen, you can see us any old time you want. Just click it and watch. And you can also see us on iTunes anytime you like to do that, or you can listen to us as an audio podcast. That, that concludes our formal announcements. <laughs> we'll see you next week on Chicago Newsroom. Thanks for watching. Bye.